this ball is dropped from a bit higher than what it shows in the diagram. I'll draw it in. So it starts maybe here, uh, which they say is one meter above the actual spring. Uh, so it's dropped from, no, it's not dropped from rest. It's thrown downwards, actually, at an initial speed of three meters per second. And as it falls by one more meter, it's going to gain a bit more speed uh, as it falls for that one meter. Then it hits the spring perfectly, um, uh, head on. So it's going to squish the spring. And at some point, the spring is going to get to... Uh, well, at some point, the spring is going to stop the ball. And that's the moment we're seeking where the maximum amount the spring deforms by. So at some point, the spring will stop the ball, the ball will be at rest for that instant, uh, and then the spring will actually push back up and push the ball back up into the air. But uh, we're not asked to analyze the second half of that, we're only asked to analyze up to this point of maximum compression. So I'm gonna actually draw that in towards the right so we'll have the floor and at some point that, okay, let's try that again. So it'll squish the spring a bit and maybe it gets to about here, at which point uh, we'll consider that the maximum compression. So you're going to label that, uh, I don't know what that is, I'll call that X2, standing for the compression in the spring at moment 2. Um, moment 1 Moment one's going to be way up here. Um, at, at that one meter above the spring mark, that is moment one, and moment two is going to be this point of maximum compression. Some people may be tempted to split this question into two separate parts, um, have a moment one, a moment two, when the ball touches the spring, and then a moment three, down at the lowest point. There's actually no need to split it into those two parts. You can actually go straight from one meter above the ball all the way to the maximum compression, just in one fell swoop. And this is the conservation of mechanical energy. Um, there's no non-conservative forces dealing anything here. It's just gravity and elastic force. So, um, K1 plus Gravitational potential 1 plus spring potential 1. So that's the starting mechanical energy. Has to equal the ending mechanical energy. So kinetic 2, gravitational potential 2, and spring potential 2. Six terms. Uh, only gets slightly more complex than this. Some problems may have friction or may have air resistance, and then you have to deal with that as well, which would add a seventh term to this equation. But uh, this one only has six, uh, and some of these are going to be zero. So let's start crossing those out. So at moment one, the ball is thrown. So unfortunately, they did not just release it from rest. If they did, we could cross out K1, but no, they throw the ball, so uh, we cannot cross out K1. Gravitational potential, uh, that's going to depend on where we set the reference height. Um, uh, 
Huh. Yeah, we got some options here to set a reference height. Uh, I know where I would do it, but I'm trying to predict where some of you will set the reference height. Okay, I'll, I'll do something a little awkward. I'm going to set the reference height uh, at the level of the moment two. The lowest point the ball gets, basically, uh, in this situation. That's actually not where I normally would. I'd probably set it right at the moment it hits the spring. But I want to, I want to show you what happens if we set the reference height down here. We set the reference height down there. Uh, we can cross off gravitational two. That'll be zero. So that's the that's the advantage of setting the reference height down there. But it does come with a disadvantage, which you may see a bit later. Okay, uh, another zero will actually be the spring at the start at moment one. At moment one, the ball is in the air. It has not even hit the spring yet. So the spring is just chilling there in its natural position. It's not stretched, it's not compressed, so there's no, there's no spring potential energy then. And we actually have one more zero um, at moment two, at the point of maximum spring compression. The ball is at rest at that instant, so we can actually have K2 be zero as well. So it's not a six-term equation, it's a, a three-term equation, um, a bit more manageable. So we're going to start filling in some, some expressions here. So for kinetic energy, that would be half mv squared. For gravitational, so here is where we see the disadvantage of setting the reference height at the very bottom. The height at moment one is uh, it's going to be x plus 1 meter. So see if you can um, reason that out. So x2, I'll call it, I, I label it x2. So there's a distance x2, but the ball was actually released 1 meter above that. So you have to add the 1 there to get the total height of moment 1. Okay. And then over on the right side, we have uh, spring potential energy at moment two. So that'll be half k x squared. And um, I'm just going to go through and underline what I don't know, which would be, so do I know the mass? Yes. Do I know the, the starting speed? Yes. G is 9.8, we assume, we're on Earth. Uh, what I don't know and what I have to solve for, actually, this is the question, is X. How much did the spring compress by is what we have to solve for. And the K value is also given at 300 newtons per meter. So actually, yeah, there's only one unknown here. It, it shows up twice in the equation, but still it's only one variable we don't know. And it turns out... Uh, this is a quadratic equation. X is squared, and we also have a, an X term that's not squared, so uh, we're going to be solving a quadratic here. So what I'll do is um, we'll go with the distributive property here and fill in some numbers maybe at the same time in some other places. So for half mv squared, we have 2.0, 3.0 squared. And yeah, I'm just going to do distributive property here. And then on the right side, I'll fill in some numbers here. Half 300 is the k value. Uh, I'm also going to, so this is what I normally do, actually, personally. I Oops. I don't think there's a need to have this subscript of 2. Um, there, there is no x1. The x1, the, the spring is not stretched or compressed. Um, 
at moment one, so the x one's never going to show up in this equation. So I don't really have to worry about keeping track too, too much in terms of labeling it x two. So I'm just going to label it x. Make it easier on my mental capacity here. Okay, so um, I'm going to do some more substituting numbers and evaluating some expressions. So half times two times three squared, that turns out to be nine. Uh, M times G, I'll go with two times 9.8 X plus M times G without an X, so two times 9.8. And then half times 300, I'll calculate that. That's 150. Do some more evaluating here, so 2 times 9.8 um, is 19.6x plus another 19.6 without an x equals 150x squared. And um, bring everything to one side, so because I'm solving quadratic here, I need one side to be 0. So I'll make the left side 0 because I want to keep the coefficient of x squared a positive number. So we got 150x squared. We're going to subtract 19.6x uh, from both sides. And we're going to have minus uh, the 9 and the 19.6 can be added together and then moved over to the other side, 28.6. So that's a quadratic equation I have to solve. I could use the quadratic formula, um, which I'm not. I'm going to type this into Wolfram Alpha. So 0 equals 150x squared minus 19.6x minus 28.6. And Wolfram Alpha will give me a whole bunch of information about this, including that x is approximately 0 0.51. Uh, that would be in meters, so 51 centimeters is what the spring's compression is going to be. Again, a pretty long spring, uh, but we're going to go with it.